Hey guys, welcome to section 6.1. In this section, we'll talk about an introduction to radicals. Let's get started. So the first thing we need to talk about is obviously the notation of it. So when we look at radicals, this symbol is known as the radical symbol or the radical sign. And whenever you have a number out here in the, in the crevice, that's known as the index of the radical. So sometimes you might see a number here, a five or a six or a seven, and that'll be the sixth root of something. Or if you don't see a number, we assume that the index is two. The stuff that you're taking the radical of is known as the radicand, and this is obviously the radical sign. The way we read this is the nth root of x. So the way you would read this entire thing would be nth root of x. It's not n root x, it's the nth root of x. If this were a two, or if you didn't have a number here specified as the index, we would read that as the square root of x. Similarly, if the index were a three, we would call it a cube root of x. So here, notice that there is no index. We assume that it's two. So whenever we have a square root by itself, we assume that the index is always two. The radicand here is four, and the radical sign is obviously that. So the question that this asks us is, what does one need to multiply by itself? And that's the key part here. Well, not just that, but multiplication as well. So what does one need to multiply by itself in order to get the radicand? Meaning, what would we need to multiply by itself to get four as our answer? And for us, we know that, that it's two. This is known as the radical of four or the root of four. Similarly, if we take a look at cube roots, here we see that the index is three, the radicand is 64, so with cube roots, we see that the index is three, and the question we have to ask ourselves is, what does one need to multiply by itself three times to get to the radicand? So four times four is 16, 16 times four is 64. So then essentially what that gives us is that the cube root or the radical, uh, the cube root of 64 is three. So the answer is the radical or the root. couple of things to memorize. So you should always know the squares up to 15 and you should know cubes up to seven. So zero squared is zero because zero times zero is zero. One squared is one, two squared is four and so on and so forth. So I don't wanna waste time just reading these numbers out to you, but this, uh, this is a list of numbers that you should commit to memory. Similarly, the same thing for cubes. Although with cubes, I only need you to go up to sevens. So you should know all the cubes of numbers up until seven. Additionally, so in the past we have dealt with squares and cubes. Now we're going to start using powers of two as well. We're not going to use powers of two in this section or in this video, but I placed them here so that you, you, know, you can go to one place to, to revisit them all. You should know powers of two all the way from zero to 10 at the very least. And again, when we need these, I'll come back and revisit this. So here's the question then. If we just get a radical square root of nine, for instance, that part's simple, that's just three. But sometimes we won't be able to just get integer solutions like that. We might not be able to get just nice even numbers as solutions. So when we simplify radicals, here are the following goals we have to use, or we have to keep in mind. Whenever we have numbers inside of radicals, we want to try to leave the smallest possible number inside the root. With regards to variables, we want to have the exponent of the variable inside the radical to be less than that of the index. And we'll keep revisiting this slide again and again. But again, for numbers, you want to leave the smallest possible number inside the radical. For variables, you want the exponent of the variable to be less than the index.
Some rules. These are very, very important, and that's why the entire slide is in red. Not to say that the other stuff is not, but this is basically the foundation for the entire chapter. So we have two rules for now. One is the product rule and the other is the quotient rule. The product rule states that if you have an nth root, so notice that this doesn't say square root. This is just the nth root. It can be any root. It could be a square root, it could be a cube root, it could be a fourth root, fifth root, it doesn't matter. If we have an nth root of a times b, meaning I have a product of two terms on the inside of the radical, then what I'm allowed to do is split the radical along the product or around the product and turn it into the nth root of a times the nth root of b. Similarly with quotients, if I have a quotient of a over b and I'm taking the nth root of that, I can split the radical so that I can turn this problem into the nth root of a over the nth root of b. So this rule can be summarized as we can split a radical over a product and over a quotient. I wish I had a different shade of red, but this slide is even more important. So even though these are not rules of exponents, unfortunately students use these as rules, even though they shouldn't. You should never, ever, 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 ever split a radical over a sum or a difference. And I'll have examples of this in the next slide, but never, ever, 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 ever split a radical over a sum or a difference. Products and quotients only. So here are a couple of examples. If we have the square root of 16 times three, we notice that there's a product. So that allows me to split the radical into two, giving me square root of 16 times square root of three. And square root of 16 we know is four. And the way we know that is because hopefully you've memorized the list or at least you're referencing again and again. So the square root of 16 is something we can find. So that turns into four. And the square root of three, well, I can't really find the square root of three. And even if I were to try to split it up into something else, I wouldn't be able to do it. So square root of three remains as it is. Similarly, if we use the same numbers and we get three over 16 inside of a square root, excuse me, using the quotient rule, we can split up the radical into the numerator and the denominator. So this turns into square root of three over square root of 16. Square root of three by the same argument as here just stays at square root of three, whereas square root of 16 turns into four. So this is an example of the product rule in use. This is an example of the quotient rule in use. This is something that we're never, ever, ever supposed to be able to do. So if we have square root of 16 plus three, never split this and turn it into square root of 16 plus square root of three. This is never, ever, ever to be done. The same thing is true for uh, differences as well. So you can never split a radical over a sum or a difference. So you should never be able to go from here to this. These two are probably the most common mistakes I see students make over this entire chapter. Please make sure you make a note of this. You're not allowed to split a radical over a sum or a difference. So now we're moving into actual advice on how to simplify radicals when we have numbers inside of them and just numbers, nothing else. So for numbers, we want to look for the largest number on the appropriate list. So appropriate list meaning if we have a square root, we should look or think of our list of squares, our perfect squares. If we have a cube root in the problem, then we should be thinking about perfect cubes. And if we have, um, well, a power of two, then we should be thinking of a power of two. So we should look for the largest number on the appropriate list that is a factor of the radicand, of the number on the inside, and then work your way up. That means that if you can't find a factor, try the next largest number. And if you still, does, if you still can't find the factor, try the next largest number up. So you keep climbing up the list. And then finally, if you've been able to find a number that works, use the product rule to simplify your radical. And again, more examples coming up. So let's say we have a problem that says to simplify square root of 75. So what that means is we want the smallest possible number left inside this radical. 
And if it's 75, then the problem is done. There's nothing that we can do with it. But what we need to do before we can declare that the problem cannot be simplified further or that it's as simple as it's going to get, we take a look at the list of perfect squares because this is a square root. We don't have an index here explicitly written, so we assume it to be a two. And on the list of squares, we start with the largest number less than 75, which is 64. So here's where you can actually use your calculator and reduce the amount of time you have to spend. With 75, you might be inclined to say, oh, I already know that the answer is 25. But if you build good habits now, it's going to save you a significant amount of time when numbers get more annoying to play uh, with or deal with. So does 64 go into 75 evenly, or is 64 a factor of 75? Uh, it's too close, so no. Uh, and another way of, of verifying whether something is a factor or not is just to divide 75 by 64. If it works, great, it's a factor, and that's the one you use. 49 uh, is not going to go into 75 evenly. 75 divided by, divided by 36 is not a whole number either, but 75 divided by 25 is. So that's the split that we're going to use. What that means is you can rewrite the number as a product of 25 and 3 because 75 is the same as 25 times 3. Now all we have to do is use the product rule to simplify. So because I have 25 times 3 inside of the radical, because I have a product, I can split this radical down the middle and turn it into square root of 25 times square root of 3. Well, square root of 3, we've discussed it enough times already, is just square root of 3. We cannot touch it. We don't know what we would multiply by itself to get 3 as the answer. However, we know what the answer for square root of 25 is. It's just 5. So that ends up being our answer. Now, again, for numbers, we want to leave the smallest possible number inside the radical. And that's exactly what we were able to do here. There is nothing that 3 could be split up into, or we cannot make 3 smaller by rewriting it as a product of two numbers. So that means the problem is done. Looking at this example here, this is 5 times the square root of 63. Notice that if I wanted to say the fifth root of 63, the index would need to be somewhere here. So when you have a number that's you know kind of the same size as what you've written, that is just a coefficient. This is just five times whatever the square root of 63 is. If I wanted to indicate the fifth root of 63, that would need to be nestled here. So again, for this, we take, our, uh, take a look at our list of squares. And for 63, the largest number that's less than 63 is 49. 49 doesn't go into 63 evenly. 36 is not a factor. 25 is not a factor. And again, I know this because I know the factors of 63. If you don't, I'd very strongly encourage you to use a calculator and start typing these numbers in. Just do 63 divided by 49. If you get a whole number, stop. If you don't, keep trying these other numbers. So then you move on to 16. 16 is not going to work either. 9 does work. And when I say does work, I mean 9 is a factor of 63. Uh, 9 times 7 is 63. So just like we did in our previous problem, we can rewrite 63 as 9 times 7. Use the product rule after splitting it up because, well, we can do that whenever we have products. This would give us square root of 9 times square root of 7. Square root of 9 can be rewritten as square root of 3, or pardon me, square root of 9 can be rewritten as 3, and square root of 7 cannot be simplified, so we just keep it as it is. The reason why we can't do anything with 7, or rather square root of 7, is if we look at the largest number on this list less than 7, we get to 4. 4 is not a factor of 7, and then the next number over is 1. Typically, whenever we get to 1, nothing can be done with it. Because even though we might be able to rewrite 7 as 7 times 1 and split it, but that's not going to make radical 7 any smaller. So yes, even though we can have square root of 1 here, which would just turn into 1, there's nothing that is going to be able to make the 7 that's inside the radical smaller, which was our goal. 
Another example, if we have to find the square root of 450, we can rewrite 450 as 225 times 2. And the reason we know that is, well, we look at the largest number on this list of squares that's less than 450. And for our problem, we see that it's 225. And in fact, we get lucky the first hit works. 225 times 2 can, be, uh, can replace 450. And because we have a product right here, we can split up the radical into 2. We can get square root of 225 times the square root of 2. Square root of 225 is 15. And square root of 2 comes around because if we look, the largest number less than 2 on this list is 1. And remember, whenever we get to 1, the problem cannot be simplified further. Now moving on to variables, our goal was that we wanted to leave the smallest possible number inside the radical when we were dealing with numbers. But with variables, we want the exponent of the variable to be less than the index. We're looking for something different here. So please make sure you keep that straight as we look at these questions and examples. So for variables, the general principle is going to be to divide the exponent of the variable by the index. Whatever the quotient is, that goes on the outside with the variable raised to the quotient. And the remainder, or the variable raised to the remainder, stays inside the radical. This sounds a lot more complicated than it really is. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. So let's say we have to simplify x to the ninth. There's no numbers here, meaning we're not simplifying square root of 45, we're simplifying the square root of x to the ninth. Now, 9 divided by 2 is a 4 with a remainder of 1. So 2 goes into 9 evenly 4 times. And then there's 1 left over as a remainder. So what we do is we rewrite square root of x to the ninth as x to the quotient on the outside. So x to the fourth goes on the outside of the radical. And then we're left with x raised to the remainder, or x to the 1 on the inside. Now, I only wrote this here to be explicit. Normally, we would just write this and be done with it. And the reason why we know that we're done at this, pro at this stage is because the exponent on the inside is less than the index. The exponent here, which is 1, is less than the index here, which is 2. Again, for variables, we want the exponent of the variable to be less than the index, which was the case here. A couple other examples. So say we need to simplify or find the square root of x to the fourth, y to the sixth, times z to the tenth. Again, I don't see a number here, so the index is assumed to be 2. So this is a square root. I divide the power by 2, so I divide the exponent by the index, and the resulting answer, if I can do that evenly, goes on the outside of the radical. I have y to the 6th, if I divide 6 by 2, I get 3, and because the division happened evenly, I put a y to the 3rd outside the radical. I have here finally z to the 10th, and when I divide the 10 by 2, which is the index, I get z to the 5th. Notice that there's no more radical here because only the remainders stay inside. And because we had no remainders, because 2 went into 4, 6, and 10 evenly, there's no more radical left anymore. Just to ground us back in the definition, this is what we would need to multiply by itself in order to get this. That's basically what we're finding, or that's what the answer to these questions is. For instance, if we were to multiply x squared by x squared, we would end up with x to the fourth. If we multiply y cubed by y cubed, we'd end up with y to the sixth. And if we multiply z to the fifth by z to the fifth, we'd end up with z to the tenth. Remember, when you're multiplying and bases are same, you add the exponent. So 5 plus 5 would give us 10. Another example, let's say we're finding the fifth root of x to the 15th, y to the 10th, and z to the 11th. Just as a reminder, this is read as the fifth root of, well, whatever all this stuff is. So again, we divide the exponent by the index. 15 divided by 5 is 3. So x to the third goes outside. And because the division happened evenly, there's no remainder to go inside the radical. Similarly, we divide 10 by 5. So 10 divided by 5 is 2. 
So y squared goes outside the radical. And because there's no remainder, there's no y's inside the radical. Then we divide 11 by 5. Well, that's not an even division. So 5 goes into 11 evenly twice. So z squared goes outside. And then 5 times 2 was 10. The remainder is 1. So z to the first power stays inside the radical. And that's it. For this example, we have to find the seventh root of this monstrosity. It, these problems look complicated, but they really are not. They're very, very simple, very straightforward. As long as you remember the rules of, well, what is it that you have to do when you look for a number versus when you're looking at variables. With variables, you want the index to be greater than the exponent on the inside or the exponent to be less than the index. 10 is greater than 7, so we obviously have something to do here. And then the same argument applies for the other variables as well. So 7 goes into 10 evenly once. So I put an a to the first power on the outside, or just a. And then if I, when I divide 10 by 7, the remainder is 3, so I left a cubed inside the radical. Then when I divide 17 by 7 evenly, that happens twice. 2 times 7 is 14, and the remainder is 3. So I'm left with b cubed on the inside of the radical. 20 divided by 7, 7 times 2 is still 14, but the remainder is 6. So I'm left with c to the 6th inside the radical, and a c squared on the outside, because, c, uh, because 7 went into 20 evenly twice. Now, 7 goes into 35 evenly 5 times, so I have d to the 5th, with no d left inside the radical, because there's no remainder. And that's it, one step problem. Now we get to combining these two ideas together. So how would we approach these questions if we had numbers inside the radicals and the variables? And the easy way out is, well, you segregate them or you separate the numbers and the variables and you recombine your answers at the end. So here, we see that we can split up 72 times x to the fifth, y to the seventh, and z to the tenth because I have a product in the middle into two separate radicals. So I can treat all the numbers together by themselves, and I can deal with all the variables together by themselves and get uh, recombine the answers at the end. So first we'll take a look at the number itself. We have to find the square root of 72. So again, we go back to our list of perfect squares. The largest number less than 72 is 64 on this list. 64 is not a factor of 72, so we move to 49. 49 isn't either, but 36 is. So what we can do is we can rewrite 72 as 36 times 2, because 36 times 2 is 72. And because there's a product here, we can split this up into two different radicals. So we get square root of 36 times the square root of 2, Square root of 36 is 6. Square root of 2 just comes along for the ride. We cannot simplify this further. And then negative 5 times 6 gives us negative 30. And then the square root of 2 just comes along. So negative 5 radical 72 is the same as negative 30 radical 2. For the variables, uh, this is easy. We divide the exponent by the index. So 5 divided by 2 is 2 with a remainder of one, so we get x squared on the outside, and x to the one, we don't really write the one, but you can imagine that it's there, on the inside of the radical. Seven divided by two evenly happens three times, with a remainder of one, so that goes inside. 10 divided by two is exactly five, so we get a z to the fifth on the outside, with no z's on the inside. We would only have z's on the inside if we had a remainder. And now we can recombine both these answers. So once the number has been simplified as much as possible, we kind of combine the outsides with the outsides and the insides with the insides. What that means is I have a negative 30 from the outside here times x squared y cubed z to the fifth, x squared y cubed z to the fifth. So the outsides kind of get glued together. And then on the inside, we have radical 2 times radical xy. 
So that turns into square root of 2xy. For this example, we have to find the cube root of 54 times all these other variables. So again, just like we did in the previous problem, we're going to split out the number by itself because we have a product in the middle, and we're going to take all these other variables and find the cube root of them separately. And because we have to find a cube root here, we would think back to our list of perfect cubes, and the number we're looking for is 54. So the largest number less than 54 on this list is 27. And 27, thankfully, is a factor of 54, so that's what we use. So what we can do is we can rewrite 54 as a product of 27 and 2. And because I have a product here, I can split this down the middle and turn it into the cube root of 27 times the cube root of 2. The cube root of 27 is 3. We know that from 3 cubed equaling 27. Oops. And then as far as the variables go, we have to find the cube root of all these things. So again, for variables, we want to divide the exponent by the index. The quotient goes on the outside. So 5 divided by 3 is 1. So a to the first power goes on the outside. But there was a remainder of 2. Uh, 3 doesn't go into 5 evenly. So a squared stays inside the radical. And then b, if we notice, 2 is already less than 3. So there's nothing that we can do with b squared. The goal was to make the exponent less than the index, and that's already the case with b squared, so we don't touch it. Similarly with c, the exponent is 1, and it's already less than the index 3, so we just copy the c down. With d, 8 divided by 3, well that happens twice, so d squared goes on the outside, and the remainder from dividing 8 by 3 is 2, so d squared goes on the inside. And then for e to the ninth, 9 divided by 3 is 3. That happens evenly, so e to the third power goes on the outside, no e's on the inside. And then finally, to get the overall answer to the problem, we combine the outsides together. So we get 3a d squared e to the third. That's just grouping everything together. And then on the inside, here, we just throw in an extra 2 from right there, and that gives us our answer. Finally, we have to find the cube root of, well, this expression, 47a squared b c squared d cubed. So again, just like we have in the previous couple of questions, we recognize that there's a product here. We can split this into the number and the variable part of the problem. And because we're looking at perfect cubes, we think to our list of cubes, the largest number less than 47 on this list is 27. 27 is not a factor, neither is 8. And once we get to 1, we know that we can't go anywhere with it. So cube root of 47 just is cube root of 47. There's nothing you can do with it. And I, I wanted to finish with this example because there's this incumbent need that students feel that, you know, they have to be able to do something with these questions. You only find roots if it's possible to find them. If it's not possible to find uh, a cube root of 47, you just leave it as cube root of 47. You don't touch it. And then with regards to the variables, 2 is already less than 3. 2, the exponent, is less than the index 3 already. The same thing for 1, the same thing with 2. So a squared b and c squared just come down inside the radical. We don't do anything with them. And now d to the third, well, we have to find the cube root of that. So 3 divided by 3 is 1. So d to the first power goes outside. And because that happened evenly, 3 went into 3 evenly, with no remainder, there's no d left on the inside. So with this question, all you really had to do was just take the d out from d to the third, and then the rest of it just stays inside. So looking at this entire question, all that we could simplify here was d to the third. 47 is the smallest possible number that I can leave inside the root. So the number is dealt with. With regards to the variables, the 2, the 1, and the 2, these exponents are less than the index. So these are already in perfect form. And then d to the third, well, we can find the cube root of d cubed, and it's d. 
And that's it. If you guys have any questions, as always, please feel free to reach out. Have a nice day. Bye.